There are tens of thousands of kids gaming at dangerous levels in Australia, and as a society, we need to do something about it. I've seen numerous cases of parents needing to take apprehended violence orders against their kids because they become so violent when the screens are taken away. I've seen kids who develop these tremendous fears of engaging with the offline world. I've seen kids who are very depressed, very anxious. My biggest fear would be not having a social life and then all my friends just leaving me and then being a lonely person forever. I'm just then taking that loneliness to turning into depression and then just never leaving the house. Sometimes I'm just in such an angry mood that I'm unaware of, like, people around me and how they feel. When my behaviour had been at my worst, I was probably, like, throwing stuff, yelling, kicking things, punching walls. Excessive gaming changes the teenage brain. It changes the ability to focus and regulate emotions and some other important functions. I've been at the end of my tether many, many times in the last few years, and that's being an honest parent. I've just not known where to turn. I found out about the gaming program run by Wayne Warburton, and I thought, hallelujah. One of the take-home messages for the boys is that any changes to their brain that might have happened across the course of their gaming is that it's, we think it's reversible. It's a, a first time in Australia for a program like this, and I, I'm kind of excited about how things are going to go. starting the program who both have serious issues with gaming, it's going to be interesting to see how they progress. Caleb has always been a sporty kid. He's always done really well at school. He's been a pretty easy kid to, to deal with and get along with. Um, he's kind, he's thoughtful. So he's, he's been really quite easy until probably this year. Gaming probably started taking over my life during the pandemic because it was then like, you can't really go and do stuff. It's more just stay home and see what you can figure out by yourself. My biggest fear would be him becoming recluse, unable to, you know, do anything outside of playing a game that he stops interacting with the family and with his friends and, you know, just really starting to live in the one space. How would I describe Reese? Funny, full of character, can charm. <laughs> Definitely likes being active, loves his cricket, AFL, but he just, he also is passionate about being online. The things that I love about gaming is that I'm able to connect with friends when they're like, it doesn't have to be face to face. I'm able to like chat with them online and play with them online. Two years ago was when we were in a very long lockdown. Then we had the beginning of quite significant behaviour changes for Reese. In lockdown, I was spending like up to eight to nine hours a day gaming. I found him commando crawling out of my bedroom trying to take a device that I'd hidden away in the middle of the night. And I, it just hit me at that moment we're in trouble. Hi, guys. Hi. So we all set for tomorrow? 
I guess we are, yes. Yeah. yeah, very good. We've been working on this program for two and a half years. We think it's going to be really helpful for kids with a problem with screens. Thanks for coming over, it's been awesome. To be completely honest, I don't think I have ever been so stressed. We've been working very, very, very long hours. We've had plan A, plan B, plan C and plan D. We're up to plan E, I reckon. That's the task I really want to go through, is that emotion? But fingers crossed and a little bit optimistic that we're going to see um, you know, some really good results from this. Today we're starting the program. It's run by Macquarie Uni. My greatest hope is that we can develop new skills and strategies to support Reese with his gaming. I feel quite excited. Um, also a little bit nervous. Um. In his heart, he does want to make changes. True. But I also know that it's always not going to be easy. It's going to be something that he's going to struggle with. So do you think this program will tell you that you can't game? The program we're running in Australia is called RESAT A, and RESAT stands for Resources Strengthening Training. What we're trying to do is we're trying to put teenagers back in control of their gaming by strengthening their resources and their skills and their knowledge. I am a psychologist, and me and my friend Kirsten Paschke over there, we kind of put this program together because we saw lots of kids who we felt that the screens were kind of more in control of their life rather than them being in control of the screens. And we thought this program has been run out of Germany for a couple of years. It's been pretty successful. Currently, we have 11 boys. They range in ages from 13 to 17. Now, what we're not going to do is tell you how much time you should spend at the screen. The whole point of this is just about putting you back in control. He wants to take away the idea of parents having to police their kids with um, screen addiction or with gaming. So the idea is, and it's simple, is to um, equip, equip the kids with their own skills on how to manage it. What is the most common motive for gaming? They also learn about how to regulate emotions, about how to communicate with people, you know, offline as well as online. There's some what we would call cognitive behavioural therapy stuff in there, which is, you know, restructuring the way we think about things. What's the most popular digital game among teenagers? In my research, we find that about 3% of teenagers in Australia would have a diagnosis of having some sort of gaming disorder. We think about 10% of kids have, you know, enough of a problem that they would probably meet criteria for something like hazardous gaming use, where it's having some sort of negative impact. And of course, there's the 90% of kids who play, and they really don't have a problem at all. Okay, what percentage of Australian teenagers use the internet for five to eight hours on weekdays? Oh, I didn't start my working life as a psychologist. I actually started as a tradie. When Wayne and I first met, he had a plumbing business that he had nurtured since leaving school. But in 1995, it came to a pretty crashing halt. I was driving with my apprentice, and then it was like my whole world exploded. I just was in this world of crashing metal and breaking glass, and I, I thought I was going to die. They cut a hole in the wreckage, and this ambulance driver reached through, reached through that hole in the wreckage and put his hand on my shoulder. And for that whole hour that it took for them to cut me out of that car, he was he was touching my shoulder and talking me through it. You know, you we're just about to pull a bit of the roof back. There's probably gonna be glass fall in your hair. Don't worry, we'll wash it out later. After a few weeks, it was clear I couldn't return to my business as a plumber, that I would never have the physical capacity I went on to develop post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, I had horrific nightmares, um, flashbacks. So he'd lost his career, he'd lost his income, he'd lost his business that he'd nurtured for 17 years, and he was grieving that. I remember one night he was crying 
and he just really gently said to me, um, I can't live like this anymore. But things have kind of settled down into a bit of a pattern now. But somehow he picked himself up to start to make a plan. He spent the next 10 years studying psychology at Macquarie. So he graduated in 2003 and went on to do his masters and then he's finished his PhD in 2007. Adversity makes you find stuff in yourself and then you're able to kind of pass that on to other people who are struggling, you know. I mean, I was I've always thought I, I would love to be that person with the hand through the wreckage on somebody's shoulder because it's such an important role when somebody's traumatised. There's still so much to deal with. Probably what we're trying to do with this program is a little bit of me trying to kind of reach out to other people too. There's kids that are kind of having your ups and downs. Wayne is so personally invested with these kids and wants to make a real difference in their lives, not just short term, but also long term. This is Kelly, he's 13. He's a sport bike runner and he enjoys playing with his dogs. Um, he's a good runner. His favourite um, game is Mad Foot and his training goal is to reduce screen time. I was reluctant to go to the gaming program because obviously it was like out of the blue, you know, my mum didn't tell me and then when she did it was like, oh, it's going on tomorrow, you got to go. I'm not sure how committed Caleb is himself. I think he wants, wants to do it, but I do think there is an element of uh, fear and not resentment but uh, pushback. This game or activity, I guess, is about sort of bringing our attention to the present <coughs> and what's happening now. Caleb's attended the first session. Unfortunately, he did miss the second one, and that was due to him having a little bit of a hard time just with friends at school about him being a part of the gaming program. Caleb was really upset. At first, when I got teased, my number one thought was to pull out of the gaming program because then it would obviously solve it. But I stayed and, you know, I'm still here, still kicking, still improving on my, in my life. Caleb has said to me that, you know, the other kids are way worse than me. I don't even have a problem, Mum. And my response to him was that just because you look at somebody else and they're worse than you, that doesn't mean that you don't have a problem. Caleb. Yeah. Come here, please. Give me a sec. Caleb. Yeah. Here, please. Caleb. Come here. Most definitely, yes, I got an addiction to, towards gaming. Addictive is when it's a it's just an on and on situation. It's like, can't stop, won't stop. Normally I'd just play and play and play. If I lose three games in a row, I don't stop playing until I win a game. Otherwise, it's just not fun. When I game, it does relax me most of the time. It's sort of the way that I can get away from my siblings when they're having a rough time and I can't function probably because when I'm trying to do schoolwork and they're screaming, I've just got to get somewhere else. Mouth shut, please. So I go to wherever and just start gaming for the next few hours. Have you done some sneaky gaming in your time? Oh, yeah, yeah, I have. Sneaky gaming, yes, definitely have quite a few times. Most of the time it would be when my mum goes out shopping and she says, you know, do all this stuff and then you can watch TV or go play basketball for a bit and I'll just play until she gets back and then run downstairs and hide, play basketball. So this is Reese. he's 14. His uh, hobbies are playing sports and exploring the outdoors. Uh, his hidden talent is apparently he's a good singer, which I'd love to hear. <laughs> um, his favourite app slash game is Minecraft and his goal is to reduce time in front of screens. Reese, I'm not going to make you sing, but what kind of music do you like? Um, Reese is on the autism spectrum. <laughs> we see a disproportionate amount of kids on the autism spectrum have difficulties with screens. My brother is scared too. Reese is, is definitely high functioning. 
He's very good at communicating with other people and he's comfortable in a group. Take it of course you can. Thanks, mate. See you next right. week. See you, Reese. Whilst he does appear to be quite forthright and can put himself forward, they're in a peer setting he can be quite awkward. He doesn't always pick up those um, social cues in a conversation that we all might be able to pick up. So where he's interacting with other people online, he does he can do that and be safe. So what is addiction? You know, have you heard that word? Have just some people sort of... Yeah. So we look at what, what is that? What does that mean? How does an addict act? I would say that I have an addiction to gaming. You know you've got an addiction when you're spending a lot of time gaming and it's putting aside other hobbies and eating, sleeping, just basic stuff that you'd normally do, like schoolwork, playing outside with friends, doing sport. I want Reese to feel in control. Like, I think at the moment, Reese feels like the games are in control. At the other end of it, I want Reese to be able to look me in the eye and say, I think I am more in control of the games now. See how it says withdrawal symptoms? Like, is that something you would notice that you get, do you get irritable or, yeah. you know, kind of a bit angry? Yeah. And wanting to... This definitely has the same impact as, say, somebody who's using a, a drug it's living on the edge, never quite knowing what's going to happen next when they're so distressed around their lack of ability to game. The aggression will be anywhere from, you know, sort of throwing things, smashing up his room, smashing up belongings, including items like laptops or phones. Then there's the flip side of that, which is the guilt and the shame. And it's that fine line you're always running between trying to say that that's not okay, but not shaming them for the behavior. Jude's story is very typical of many parents struggling a home alone with this issue. How was work? Yeah, it was all right. It was busy. And then the siblings are living with a person who could erupt at any moment. Just got work um, to do and... It has had a huge impact on our family. That'd be great. And particularly the connection with his sister. OK. It's <laughs> something that has been significantly impacted because of his volatility and his explosions. The research is, is pretty clear that with screen addiction, it's quite common for um, the kids to become quite aggressive and sometimes quite violent when the, when the screens are taken away. We always see that the patients, they really have problems in regulating their feelings, they have problems in getting access to their feelings and knowing how they feel. Kirsten did this wonderful study where she has looked at the MRI brain images of kids with a problem in the program, compared them to normal kids who don't have a problem. This is exactly the part we're looking for because... Kids with gaming disorder have um, more problems with their working memory, uh, with concentration, with regulating their feelings. So the red part, where the difference is between both groups, this is part of the prefrontal cortex, right? This is the area that controls the feelings, that controls action. And what we see here is that there's a larger activation for the patients in this area compared to the control group, which means that they have to put a lot of more effort in regulating their feelings. In our study, we compare brain imaging at the beginning of the treatment and after the treatment, and we do see a difference after 12 weeks, which is good. After the 12 weeks, we see that this difference just disappears. Right? Kirsten's study is a, is a reasonably small study, but what we'd like to do is, is a big study with quite a number of people and, um, you know, provide much more categorical proof that this is really happening. The use it or lose a brain, where if you're not using it, there's a kind of, you know, shrinking. I think the take-home message from the study in Germany is that the brain is plastic. Offsets. If you're not using it in a way that's making it grow, then it, it can be shrinking and, and, and losing function. But if you start to use it again, then it starts to grow, you start to get more function back.
this this recent incredibly sad case of a 13 year old boy in Australia who suicided and some of that has been attributed to his gaming use. The coroner kind of expressed some surprise that there wasn't a greater public awareness that this was a problem and came to the conclusion that, you know, we, we kind of have this hidden problem in Australia and we really don't have the resources to deal with it. I think there are several messages for Australia in, in that tragic case. One of them is that we need to be teaching our kids from early in primary school about how to manage media in a, in a, in a healthy way, how to engage in a digital world in a way that works for them. And we need parents to know that if I have a problem, this is somewhere where I can go to, to get help. The program for me has had a few ups and downs. I certainly would say it has been a bit of a roller coaster ride. Getting rid of the addiction with gaming was never going to be easy. My gaming's been up and down in a way where I'd have like a bit of a spike and then I'd go back down, have a bit more of a spike and progressively go down. When I get those spikes, I have more of a temptation to game and kind of forget what to do in those situations. Reese had some bumps along the way in the program because on the autism spectrum, sometimes you have a limited capacity to cope with things. Welcome to session four. I'm going to double up on the mindfulness exercises because this is my favourite one. So we're going to have to make a sort of a big circle. I know that after I come out of this course, it's not going to be like, yippee, yay, I'm cured now. I no longer have a gaming addiction. Basically, someone's going to stand in the middle, spin and stop on somebody like that. And then it's still a struggle. He's working towards reducing his phone at night and allowing that to be put away earlier, which has been definitely a positive. Just, yeah, you're being, you're in. He's <laughs> being more compliant and, and willing to negotiate. Ah, uh, good. Thanks for seeing me today. No worries. Caleb's had an interesting journey. I think when he started, he was, like all of the kids, a little bit reluctant to be there. And he certainly had a journey that's a little bit up and down. Like, when we started, the balance was kind of like this, right? Like, yeah. the, the game's up here and, and the rest of your life was there. Like, yeah. what, where, where do you think you are in terms of that balance now? Where would you put my hands? Probably put that hand there and maybe... Really? That one a little bit lower, yeah. That is insane. That's how I feel. That is insane. Yeah. OK, well, that's, that's incredible. Um, and are you feeling better for it? Do you, do yeah, you, do you definitely. Feel, do you feel more in control of your life? Yeah, hey, hey, way, way more control now, yeah. If I hadn't have found this course, I would probably be in the same area as what I was, you know, two months ago, constantly on, on it downstairs, you know, never leaving my room. What, what you have done is really amazing, and it's exactly what... I was hoping for you, right? Yeah. Like when you look at the, the sort of objective things that we we're interested in, you know, how much sleep is he getting? How much stuff is he doing offline? I feel very positive about both how Caleb is going and how things will work out for him in the long run. If they're kind of giving this impression that, you know, actually everybody likes this. You know, My message to other kids would probably be, be don't let something like this take control so early, you know. So you just keep on going and going and going. Just watch out for how long you're playing because you never know. It will end up taking over your life and then you'll be trapped and there'll be no way out of it. What I see, you know, someone yeah. who's stronger and smarter and more skilled and much more in control. Yeah. Um, I just think that's 
an incredible achievement on your part and yeah. my respect to you. I feel a lot happier now. It's, um, it's great. I feel like I've been. It's probably the happiest I've been in a really long time. I was totally unprepared for how amazing all of the boys have been. The certificates I'm going to give out are really a testament to all of the things that they've learned and, um, and put into place in their lives. Reese, if you could come up and get your certificate. Um, Reese, you've had an interesting journey on the program, but you've just been absolutely amazing, so congratulations. Thanks. You've done really well. Thank you. Okay. Reese looked really happy when he graduated, and he deserved to. You know, he worked really hard. I really like where he landed in the end. He, he's a lot stronger, he knows a lot more, he has a lot more skills. The program isn't a panacea, but it's a kickstart to a journey. And for someone like Reese, it's been a, a very powerful kickstart. <laughs> the message in my story is to just keep persevering and just try your best. All of you are, are kind of part of the Reset family now. The course has changed a lot of things in my life. I'm now a lot more social with my friends. I've reduced my hours more and I've just been able to get much more sleep. It's led to me being much more healthy and happier. The next person that I want to bring up is Caleb. <laughs> Caleb, you have been amazing and it's been an absolute privilege, thank you. So on the whole, the outcomes for this have been really, really positive. Not a single kid has gone backwards. All of them have shown some benefits, but those benefits have ranged from some to, you know, wow. We really want to be there to help you continue this journey. Okay. It certainly exceeded my expectations. And given the huge need in Australia, I believe that this program or programs like it really need to be widely rolled out in this country. The pizzas are here. Let's go and eat. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. It's a time. I think the future for, for Reese and Caleb is great. Firstly, because they're both great human beings, like you guys are fantastic. But you've also developed some real strength and some real skills over these last couple of months that I think are going to be you know, very helpful to you, like not just with screens, but like with the whole of your life. I really am so proud of both of you. You're both amazing.